Dracula by Bram Stoker. Jonathan Harker's journal, kept in shorthand. 3rd of May, Bistritz. Left Munich on 1st of May, travelling by train via Vienna and Budapest, en route to Transylvania. The district named by Count Dracula is in the extreme east of the country, in the midst of the Carpathian Mountains, one of the wildest and least known portions of Europe. I was not able to light on the exact locality of Castle Dracula, but I found that Bistritz, the post town named by Count Dracula, is fairly well known. It was twilight when we got to Bistritz. Count Dracula had directed me to go to the Golden Kroner Hotel. I was evidently expected, for an elderly woman in peasant dress bowed as I came in and said, The Herr Englishman? Yes, I said, Jonathan Harker. She smiled and handed me a letter. My friend, Welcome to the Carpathians. I am anxiously expecting you. Sleep well tonight. At three tomorrow the diligence will start for Bukovina. A place on it is kept for you. At the Borgo Pass my carriage will await you and will bring you to me. Your friend, Dracula. The 4th of May. This afternoon, before I was due to leave, the old lady came up to my room and said, in evident distress, O oh, young Herr, do you know what you are going to? Must you go? I told her that I was engaged on important business, that I must go. She then dried her eyes, and taking out a crucifix, fastened it round my neck. For your mother's sake, she said. Then she left the room. Whether it is the old lady's fear, I do not know, but I am not feeling easy in my mind. 5th of May The Castle when I got on the coach, I saw the driver talking with the landlady and some of the passengers. They were evidently talking of me, for every now and then they looked at me pityingly. This was not pleasant for me, just starting for an unknown place to meet an unknown man. Then our driver cracked his big whip over the four horses, and we set off on our journey. I soon lost myself in the beauty of the scene as we drove along. At length I could see a cleft in the hills, the Borgo Pass. As we flew along, the driver leaned forward, and on each side the passengers peered eagerly into the darkness. I was now myself looking out for the conveyance which was to take me to the Count, but there was no sign of a vehicle. The passengers drew back with a sigh of gladness. Turning to me, the driver said, There is no carriage here. The Herr is not expected after all. He will now come on to Bukovina. Whilst he was speaking, a caleche with four coal-black horses drew up beside the coach. They were driven by a tall man with a long brown beard and a great black hat, which seemed to hide his face from us. I could only see the gleam of a pair of very bright eyes, which seemed red in the lamplight, as he said to the driver, You are early tonight, my friend. The man stammered in reply, The English hare was in a hurry. You cannot deceive me, my friend. I know too much. With exceeding alacrity, my bags were handed out and put in the caleche. Then the driver helped me down with the hand which caught my arm in a grip of steel. Without a word, he shook his reins, the horses turned, and we swept into the darkness of the pass. Soon we were hemmed in with trees. It grew colder and colder, and fine powdery snow began to fall. From the mountains on each side of us came the wild howling of wolves. I grew dreadfully afraid, but the driver was not in the least disturbed. We kept on ascending, until suddenly I became conscious of the fact that the driver was pulling up the horses in the courtyard of a vast ruined castle, whose broken battlements showed a jagged line against the now moonlit sky. When the caleche stopped, the driver jumped down, and assisted me to alight. Then he took out my traps and placed them next to a great door set in a projecting doorway of carved stone. Then he jumped again into his seat and shook the reins, and trap and all disappeared down one of the dark openings. 
The time I waited seemed endless, and doubts and fears crowded upon me. Was this a customary incident in the life of a solicitor sent out to explain the purchase of a London estate to a foreigner? Suddenly, I heard heavy steps approaching behind the great door. There was the clanking of massive bolts drawn back. A key was turned with a loud grating noise, and the door swung open. Within stood a tall old man with a long white moustache, clad in black from head to foot. His lamp threw out long quivering shadows as it flickered in the draught of the open door. Count Dracula, I said. He bowed, and with an icy hand grasped my own with a strength which made me wince. I am Dracula. Welcome, Mr. Harker, to my house. Come in. The night air is chill, and you must need to eat and rest. So saying, he carried my traps along the passage, then up a great winding stair, and along another great passage, on whose stone floor our steps rang heavily. At the end, he threw open a heavy door, and we entered a well-lit room in which a table was spread for supper, and on whose mighty stone hearth a great fire of logs flared. The Count opened another door and motioned me to enter. It was a welcome sight, a great bedroom, well lighted and warmed with another log fire. Leaving my luggage inside, he withdrew, saying, You will need, after your journey, to refresh yourself. When you are ready, come into the other room where you will find your supper prepared. After making a hasty toilet, I went into the other room where I found supper already laid out. My host stood on one side of the great stone fireplace. I pray you be seated and sup how you please. You will excuse me that I do not join you, but I have dined already. I fell to at once on an excellent roast chicken. During the time I was eating, the Count chatted with me about my journey, and I had the opportunity of observing him. I found him of a very marked physiognomy. His face was very strong, aquiline, with a thin nose and peculiarly arched nostrils. His forehead was lofty and domed. His eyebrows were bushy, and the mouth, under the heavy moustache, was fixed and cruel-looking. His teeth were peculiarly sharp and white, and protruded over lips of remarkable ruddiness. The general effect was one of extraordinary pallor. As the Count leaned over me, his hands touched me, and I shuddered. Abruptly he rose and said, You must be tired. Tomorrow you shall sleep as late as you will. I have to be away till the afternoon, so sleep well. And with a courteous bow, he opened the door for me, and I entered my bedroom. I am all in a sea of wonders. God keep me, if only for the sake of my dear Mina. The 7th of May. I slept till late in the day. When I had dressed, I went next door and found breakfast laid out. There was a card on the table on which was written, I have to be absent for a while. Do not wait for me. D. So I set to and enjoyed a hearty meal. When I finished, I looked about for something to read. Opening another door in the room, I found a sort of library containing a vast number of English books, whole shelves of them, all relating to England and English life and customs. Whilst I was looking at the books, the door opened and the Count entered. I am glad you have found your way in here, he began. These have been good friends to me ever since I had the idea of going to London. Through them I have come to know your great England. But come, he said, taking a seat near the fire, tell me of the house which you have procured for me. It lies at Purfleet, I rejoined, on a by-road. The estate is called Carfax. It is surrounded by a high stone wall which contains in all some twenty acres with many trees, which make it in places gloomy. The house itself is large, dating back to medieval times, and communicates by a door with an old chapel or church. Without the walls there are but few dwellings close at hand. 
one being a very large house recently formed into a private lunatic asylum. When I had finished, he said, well, I'm glad that it is old and big. I myself am of an old family, and to live in a new house would kill me. I rejoice also that there is a chapel of old times. We Transylvanian nobles love not to think that our bones may be amongst the common dead. I seek not gaiety nor bright sunshine. I love the shade and the shadow, and would be alone with my thoughts when I may. Presently, with excuse, he left me. While he was away, I glanced at some of the books around me. One was an atlas, which I found opened at England. In certain places, little rings were marked. One was near London, on the east side, where his new estate was situated. Another was Whitby, on the Yorkshire coast. 8th of May. I only slept a few hours. When I got up, I had hung my shaving glass by the window and was just beginning to shave. Suddenly I felt a hand on my shoulder and heard the Count's voice saying, Good morning. I started. It amazed me that I had not seen him, for the whole room behind me was displayed in the glass. In starting I had cut myself slightly, and my cut had bled a little. When the Count saw it, his eyes blazed with a demoniac fury. Then his glance fell on the crucifix hanging in my throat. It made an instant change in him. Take care how you cut yourself, he said. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. Then he seized the shaving glass. This is the wretched thing that has done the mischief. Away with it. And opening the heavy window with one wrench of his terrible hand, he flung it out. Then he withdrew without a word. Afterwards, I did a little exploring in the castle. On the stairs, I found a window with a magnificent view. The castle is on the very edge of a precipice, a thousand feet up. As far as the eye can reach is a sea of green treetops, with occasional deep rifts where rivers wind in gorges through the forests. I explored further. Doors, doors everywhere, all locked and bolted. At length, I heard the great door below shut. The Count had returned. I went cautiously to my own room. When later I saw him through a chink in the door laying the table in the dining room, I was assured of what I had all along thought. There are no servants in the house. It must have been the Count himself who was the driver of the coach that brought me here. 12th of May. Last evening the Count said, have you written any letters? I answered that I had not. Then write now, my young friend, he said. Write to whomever you choose. But I pray you, do not discourse of things other than business in your letters. It will doubtless please your friends to know that you are well. Is it not so? As he spoke, he handed me notepaper and envelopes. I understood that I should be careful what I wrote, for he would be able to read it. So I determined to write only a formal note now, but to write fully to Mina in secret and in shorthand, which would puzzle the Count if he did see it. When I had written my letter, the Count took it up and said, I trust you will forgive me, but I have much work to do in private this evening. At the door he turned. Let me advise you that should you leave these rooms, you will not sleep in any other part of the castle. Be warned sleep only in these rooms, or in your own chamber. Then he left me. After a little while, not hearing any sound, I came out and went up the stone stair to the window. The beautiful expanse was bathed in soft yellow moonlight. As I leaned out, my eye was caught by something moving, a story below me. In terror, I watched the Count slowly emerge from his window and begin to crawl down the castle wall over that dreadful abyss, face down, with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. What manner of man is this, or creature, in the semblance of man? I am in awful fear. 15th of May 
Once more have I seen the Count go out in his lizard fashion. He moved downward some hundred feet and vanished. I knew he had left the castle now, and taking up a lamp, I went down the stone stairs to the hall where I had entered originally, but the door was locked and the key was gone. I went on to explore various stairs and passages. At last I found a door at the top of a stairway which, though locked, gave under pressure. In the end room of the suite, the windows looked out over a great precipice with a wide valley below. A soft quietude came over me, and the wide expanse without gave a sense of freedom which refreshed me. I lay down on a great couch, looking out at the lovely view. I suppose I must have fallen asleep. Suddenly I was not alone. Opposite me were three young women, ladies by their dress and manner. Though the moonlight was behind them, they threw no shadow on the floor. They came close to me and whispered. Two were dark, with great piercing red eyes. The other was fair with golden hair and eyes like pale sapphires. All three had brilliant white teeth that shone against the ruby of their voluptuous lips. Go on, said one, laughing. You were first. He is young. And there are kisses for us all. I lay quiet, looking out under my eyelids. The fair girl advanced and, kneeling, bent over me. I could feel her breath upon me. Lower and lower went her head, as the lips went below the range of my mouth. Then I felt the soft, shivering touch of lips on my throat, and two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. In languorous ecstasy, I waited. At that instant, the Count, in a storm of fury, grasped the fair woman and, with a fierce sweep of his arm, hurled her from him. In a low whisper, he exclaimed, How dare you touch him when I had forbidden it? Back, I tell you, this man belongs to me. I promise you that when I am done with him, you shall kiss him at your will. Now go. Are we to have nothing tonight? said one of them, with a low laugh. For answer, he pointed to a bag on the floor. One of the women jumped forward and opened it. There was a gasp and a low wail, as of a half-smothered child. And the women closed round. And as I looked, they disappeared into the rays of the moonlight. And with them, the dreadful bag. Then horror overcame me, and I sank down unconscious. I awoke in my own bed. If it was no dream, the Count must have carried me here. 19th of May. Last night, the Count asked me to write another letter, saying that I should start for home the next morning from the time of the letter, explaining that posts were few and my writing now would ensure ease of mind to my friends. To have refused would be to excite his suspicion. My only chance is to prolong my opportunities. Something may give me the chance to escape. When I asked him what date I should put on the letter, he answered, June 29th. Now I know the span of my life. God help me. 28th of May. This morning I heard without a cracking of whips and a pounding of horses' feet. I hurried to the window and saw in the courtyard a great lighter wagon driven by a party of Zigani gypsies, with wide hats, dirty sheepskins and high boots. The wagon contained a great square empty box with handles of thick rope, which the gypsies unloaded and carried away out of my vision. The Zigani are encamped now in the courtyard. I have written to Mina in shorthand, and shall try to have it posted. 30th of May. Today I threw the letter down to the Zigani with a gold piece. The man who took it bowed and put it in his cap. This evening the Count came, 
and sat down beside me, saying in his smoothest voice, The Zigani have given me this. As he opened my letter, he caught sight of the shorthand symbols, and his eyes blazed. This is a vile thing, an outrage upon friendship and hospitality. And he calmly held letter and envelope in the flame of the lamp till they were consumed. Then he went out of the room. 24th of June, before morning. Last night I again watched the Count emerge lizard fashion from his window. Slung over his shoulder was the terrible bag. There could be no doubt as to his quest. After a couple of hours, I heard from the Count's room a sharp wail. Then, awful, chilling. Silence. Suddenly in the courtyard, I heard the agonized cry of a woman. I rushed to the window. There indeed was a woman with disheveled hair, wringing her hands. When she saw my face, she shouted, Monster, give me my child! And throwing herself forward out of my vision, she pounded the door. From somewhere above, I heard the harsh whisper of the Count calling. His call seemed to be answered from far and wide by the howling of wolves. Before long... A pack of them poured into the courtyard. There was no cry from the woman, and the howling of the wolves was but short. I could not pity her, for I knew now what had become of her child, and she was better dead. 29th of June. Today is the date of my last letter. I was in my room when the Count entered and grimly said, Tomorrow, my friend, we must part. Your letter home has been dispatched. I shall not be here, but all shall be ready for your journey. In the morning come the Zigani. When they have gone, my carriage shall come for you. And with a slight bow, he left the room. I was about to lie down when I heard a whispering at my door. I went to it and listened. Back, back to your own place, said the voice of the Count. Have patience. Tomorrow night, he is yours. There was a low ripple of laughter. In a rage, I threw open the door and saw without the three terrible women licking their lips. With a horrible laugh, they ran away. It is then so near the end. Tomorrow. Lord, help me. 30th of June. This morning I decided to obtain at any risk the key to the locked entrance door below. The Count might kill me, but death now seems the happier choice of evils. I went straight to the window and at once got outside on the narrow ledge of stone which runs round the building. I made for the Count's window and soon found myself standing at the window sill. Bending, I slid inside. There was no sign of the Count. The room was empty and covered with dust. At one corner was a heavy door. It was open and led to a dark circular stairway. I descended. At the bottom, a dark tunnel-like passage led to another heavy door which stood ajar. I entered and found myself in an old ruined chapel. I went down the steps into the vaults. There I made a discovery. In the great box which had been brought by the Zigani, on a pile of newly dug earth lay the Count. He was either dead or asleep, I could not say which, for the eyes were open and stony. There was no sign of movement, no breath, no beating of the heart. On the lips were gouts of fresh blood, which trickled from the corners of the mouth. I shuddered as I bent to search him, but no sign could I find of the key. There was a mocking smile on the bloated face. This was the demon I was helping to transfer to London. The very thought drove me mad. Seizing a shovel which laid a hand, I lifted it high and struck edge downward at that hateful face. As I did so, the head turned, and the horrible red eyes fell full upon me. The sight paralyzed me, and the shovel turned and glanced from the face, making a deep gash above the forehead. 
The shovel fell against the box lid, which dropped shut to hide the horrid thing from my sight. I fled from the place and gained the Count's room. As I did so, I heard without the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips, the Zigani were coming. I listened and heard downstairs the grinding of a key in a great lock and the falling back of a heavy door, then the sound of feet tramping, the vaults. I turned to run down again to find the new entrance, but at that moment a violent wind blew the door to with a shock. When I ran to push it open, I found that it was hopelessly fast. I was again a prisoner. As I write, there is the sound of hammering, the box lid being nailed down. Now in the passage below is the sound of a heavy weight being shifted, and heavy feet tramping again along the hall. The door is shut. The key is grinding in the lock. Hark! In the courtyard, the roll of heavy wheels and the crack of whips passing into the distance. I am alone in the castle with those awful women. I shall not remain here. I shall scale the castle wall farther than I have yet attempted. I may yet find a way from this cursed spot. God help me in my task. Goodbye, Nina. If I fail... Letter from Mrs. Mina Harker to Miss Lucy Westenra, the 9th of May. Dearest Lucy, forgive my long delay in writing. I have been practicing shorthand and typewriting so that I can be useful to Jonathan in his work. I have just had a few hurried lines from him from Transylvania. He is well and will be returning soon. I am longing to hear his news. You must tell me all your news when you write. I hear rumors of a tall, handsome, curly-haired man, your loving Mina. Letter, Lucy Westenra, to Mina Harker, 24th of May. Dearest Mina, someone has evidently been telling tales. The tall, curly-haired man is Mr. Arthur Homewood, who comes often to see us. He and Mama get on very well together. Oh, Mina, couldn't you guess? I love him, and he loves me. My dear, it never rains, but it pours. Today I have had three proposals from three handsome, well-bred gentlemen who are the best of friends. Isn't it awful? I feel truly sorry for two of the poor fellows. The first was Dr. John Seward, who has an immense lunatic asylum under his care. The second, Mr. Quincy P. Morris, an American from Texas. I had to tell them both that there was someone else that I loved, and though disappointed, they both swore eternal friendship with me. I needn't tell you of number three, need I? Dearest Arthur, I am very, very happy to have such a lover, such a friend, and such a husband-to-be. Your loving Lucy. Dr. Seward's Diary 25th of April since my rebuff of yesterday, I have a sort of empty feeling. Oh, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor with Arthur, whose happiness is yours. I know that the only cure for this sort of thing is work. So I shall go down among my patients and pick out one to study. There is one I have determined to understand. R. M. Renfield who experiences regular periods of gloom, ending in some fixed idea which I cannot make out. A possibly dangerous man. I shall question him more fully to learn the facts of his hallucinations. Quincy has written to invite me to supper with Arthur. <laughs> we shall mingle our weeps over the wine cup and drink a health to the happiest man in all the wide world. In the meantime, work, work. Mina Harker's Journal, 24th of July, Whitby. Lucy met me at the station, 
and we drove up to the house of the Crescent, in which they have rooms. Lucy and I had a most interesting talk about Arthur and their coming marriage, which made me heartsick, for I haven't heard from Jonathan for a whole month. Arthur is the only son of Lord Godalming, and is coming up as soon as he can leave town, for his father is seriously ill. Dr. Seward's Diary 1st of July The case of Renfield grows ever more interesting. His hobby was catching flies and feeding them to spiders, which he keeps in a box. Now he has a new pet, a sparrow, which he has tamed by feeding it the spiders. 19th of July My friend now has a whole colony of sparrows, and has asked me to let him have a cat. When I told him it would not be possible, he looked suddenly fierce, the look of an undeveloped homicidal maniac. 20th of July. Visited Renfield this morning and found him humming a tune. Not seeing his birds, I asked him where they were. He replied that they had all flown away. The attendant has just been to say that Renfield is very sick and has disgorged a whole lot of feathers. My belief is, doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds raw. Mina Harker's Journal, 26th of July. Yesterday I had a line from Jonathan saying that he is just starting for home. That is not like him, and it makes me uneasy. Then, too, Lucy has lately taken to walking in her sleep. Her mother and I have decided that I am to lock the door of our room every night. Cutting from the Daily Graph, 9th of August, Whitby. On Saturday evening, one of the greatest storms ever experienced here broke with a rapidity which seemed incredible. A little after midnight, the Coast Guard searchlight discovered a schooner with all sails set rushing towards the harbour. As if by a miracle, the ship found the harbour mouth and pitched herself on the sand and gravel adjacent to Tate Hill Pier. At the instant the shore was touched, an immense dog jumped from the bow onto the sand where it disappeared in the darkness. Not a soul was found on the vessel, save for the body of the dead captain, who was fastened by his hands to the spokes of the wheel, a crucifix clutched in one hand. A doctor has ascertained that the man must have been dead for quite two days. The schooner is a Russian, from Varna, the Demeter, with only a small amount of cargo, including a great wooden box which was consigned to a Whitby solicitor, Mr. S. F. Billington who formally took possession of it. The dog, which landed when the ship struck, is evidently a fierce brute, for early this morning a large dog was found in the roadway close to the churchyard with its throat torn away. No trace has ever been found of the great dog. Tomorrow we'll see the funeral of the dead seaman, and so we'll end this one more mystery of the sea. Mina Harker's Journal 8th of August. The storm last night was fearful. Strangely enough, Lucy did not wake, but got up twice and dressed herself. Fortunately, each time I managed to undress her without waking her and got her back in bed. 10th of August. The funeral of the poor sea captain today was most touching. The coffin was carried all the way from the pier up to the churchyard. Poor Lucy seemed restless and uneasy all the time, and I cannot but think that her dreaming at night is telling on her. I shall take her for a long walk to Robin Hood's Bay and back. She ought not to have much inclination for sleepwalking then. 11th of August, 3 a.m. We had a lovely walk and crept off to bed as soon as we could. I fell asleep as soon as I had watched Lucy slip off before me. Suddenly I awoke and sat up. Lucy's bed was empty, and she was not in the room. I threw on some clothes and got ready to look for her. She could not have been far, as she was only in her nightdress. Downstairs I found the hall door open. Taking a heavy shawl, I ran out. The clock was striking one, and there was not a soul in sight. I flew along the north terrace and down to the pier and the bridge, making for the east cliff. My knees trembled as I toiled up the endless steps to the abbey. When I got to the top, I could see, on our favourite seat, 
a half-reclining figure, snowy white. It seemed as though something dark stood behind, bending over it. I called out, and something raised its head. I could see a white face and red, gleaming eyes. Lucy did not answer, and I ran on to the entrance of the churchyard. For a moment the church was between me and the seat, and I lost sight of her. When I came in view again, I could see Lucy with her head lying over the back of the seat. She was quite alone. When I bent over her, I could see that she was still asleep, breathing in long, heavy gasps. As I came close, she put up her hand and moaned, pulling the collar of her nightdress close round her throat, as though she felt the cold. I flung the warm shawl over her and fastened it at her throat with a big safety pin. When I had her carefully wrapped up, I began very gently to wake her. When she opened her eyes, she trembled and clung to me. We got home without meeting a soul, and I tucked her into bed. Before falling asleep, she implored me not to say a word to anyone, even her mother. I promised, thinking of her mother's delicate health. I have locked the door, and the key is tied to my wrist. Lucy is sleeping soundly, and dawn is coming. I was sorry to notice that my clumsiness with the safety pin hurt her, for the skin of her throat was pierced by two little red points, like pinpricks, and on the band of her nightdress was a drop of blood. 11th of August Yesterday Lucy slept till I woke her, and we passed a happy day. In the evening we strolled in the casino terrace and went to bed early. Lucy fell asleep at once. I awoke in the night and found her sitting up in bed, asleep, pointing to the window. I pulled aside the blind and looked out. In the moonlight, a great bat flitted in great whirling circles, finally disappearing across the harbour towards the abbey. When I came back from the window, Lucy was sleeping peacefully. She did not stir again all night. 14th of August. Lucy went early to bed. I saw her asleep and went out for a stroll, thinking of Jonathan. Coming home in the bright moonlight, I glanced up at our window and saw Lucy's head leaning out. She was fast asleep, and by her, seated on the window sill, was something that looked like a good-sized bird. I ran upstairs. As I came into the room, she was moving back to her bed, still asleep, and breathing heavily. She was holding her hand to her throat as though to protect it from cold. 17th of August. Lucy was languid and tired. She eats and sleeps well, but gets weaker day by day. I trust her feeling ill may not be from that unlucky prick of the safety pin. The tiny wounds at her throat seem larger than before. Unless they heal within a day or two, I shall insist on the doctor seeing them. Letter, Samuel F. Billington and Son, Solicitors Whitby, to Messrs. Carter Patterson and Company, London, 17th of August. Dear Sirs, herewith please receive invoice of box sent by Great Northern Railway. Same is to be delivered at Carfax, near Purfleet, immediately on receipt at King's Cross. The house is at present empty, but enclosed, please find keys all labelled. Please deposit the box in the ruined chapel at the side of the mansion. Leave the keys in the main hall of the house, where the proprietor may find them. Faithfully yours, Samuel F. Billington and Son. Letter, Sister Agatha, Hospital of St. Mary, Budapest, to Mrs. Wilhelmina Harker, the 12th of August. Your husband has been under our care for nearly six weeks suffering from a violent brain fever. He has had some fearful shock, and in his delirium his ravings have been dreadful. Be careful with him, for the traces of such an illness do not lightly die away. I have no doubt that he will, in a few weeks, be all himself. Yours, with sympathy and all blessings, Sister Agatha. 
Nina Harker's journal. 19th of August. At last, news of Jonathan. The dear fellow has been ill. I am to leave in the morning for Budapest to bring him home. My journey is all mapped out and my baggage ready. Dr. Seward's diary. 19th of August. Strange and sudden change in Renfield last night. At about eight o'clock he began to sniff about, as a dog does when setting, saying repeatedly, The master is at hand. Perhaps it's some form of religious mania which has seized him. If so, we must look out, for a strong man with a homicidal and religious mania at once might be dangerous. 20th of August. I was awakened at two o'clock this morning with the news that Renfield had escaped. I threw on my clothes, and taking four men with me, I ran in the direction the patient had gone. As we broke through the trees, we saw a white figure scaling the high wall which separates our grounds from those of the deserted Carfax estate. Crossing the wall ourselves, we ran after him, and found him pressed against the door of the old chapel, apparently talking to someone. As I drew near, I heard him say, I await your commands, dear master. I am your slave. When we closed in on him, he fought like a wild beast. He is safe now, at any rate. A straight waistcoat keeps him restrained, and he is chained to the wall in the padded room. His cries are at times awful. Letter, Mina Harker, to Lucy Westenra, Budapest, 24th of August. Dearest Lucy, I found Jonathan thin and pale, a wreck of himself. He does not remember anything that has happened to him. When I arrived, he asked for his coat and withdrew from a pocket his notebook. My dear Mina, he said, I have had a great shock, and I do not know if it was all real or the dreaming of a madman. Here is my notebook. Read it, if you will, but never let me know. Then he fell back exhausted. I took the book from him and told him that I would never open it unless it were for his own dear sake or for the sake of some stern duty. I must attend to my husband. Goodbye, my dear. Your ever-loving Mina Harker. Letter Lucy Westenra to Mina Harker, Whitby, 30th of August. My dearest Mina, I wish you could stay with us here. This strong air would soon restore Jonathan. It has quite restored me. I am full of life and sleep well. Arthur is here, and I love him more than ever. We are to be married on the 28th of September. There he is, calling to me. Your loving Lucy. Dr. Seward's diary, 23rd of August. Renfield grows even more interesting. His eyes, having regained something of their old softness, I had released him. Tonight he managed again to escape into the grounds of the deserted house, and we found him in the same place, pressed against the old chapel door. When he saw me, he became furious, and the attendant seized him. Then a strange thing happened. After struggling violently, he suddenly grew calm. I caught the patient's eye and followed it, but could trace nothing in the moonlit sky except a big bat, which was flapping its silent and ghostly way to the west. The patient grew calmer every instant, and presently said, You needn't tie me. I shall go quietly. Without trouble, we came back to the house. I feel there is something ominous in his calm, and shall not forget this night. Lucy Westenra's diary. Hillingham, 25th of August. Last night I seemed to be dreaming again, just as I was at Whitby. Perhaps it is the change of air, or getting home again. I tried to keep awake, but when the clock struck twelve, there was a scratching or flapping at the window. I remember no more. This morning I am horribly weak, and my throat pains me. I must cheer up when Arthur comes, or he will be grieved to see me so. Letter, Arthur Homewood, to Dr. Seward, 31st of August. Dear Jack, I want you to do me a favour. Lucy is ill and is getting worse every day. I told her I should ask you to see her, and she finally consented. Come to lunch at Hillingham tomorrow at two o'clock. After lunch, 
Lucy will take an opportunity of being alone with you. I am summoned to see my father, who is worse. I am filled with anxiety. Write me fully by tomorrow's post. Arthur. Letter, Dr. Seward, to Arthur Homewood, 2nd of September. Dear old fellow, I hasten to let you know that in my opinion there is no functional disturbance or malady that I know of. At the same time, I am not by any means satisfied with Lucy's appearance and have written to my old friend and master, Professor Van Helsing of Amsterdam, who knows as much about obscure diseases as anyone in the world. I've asked him to come over at once. He is a metaphysician and one of the most advanced scientists of his day, with the kindliest and truest heart that beats. I have full confidence in him. I shall see Lucy tomorrow again. Yours always, John Seward. Letter, Dr. Seward, to the Honourable Arthur Homewood, 3rd of September. Dear Art, Van Helsing has come. Lucy was very sweet to the Professor, although I could see the poor girl was making a hard struggle for it. I believe Van Helsing saw it too. After his examination, he drew me aside and said, I can find no functional cause. There has been much blood lost, but her conditions are in no way anemic. The disease interests me, as does the sweet young dear, I must think. Letter, Dr. Seward, to the Honourable Arthur Homewood, 6th of September. Dear Art, my news today is not so good. After several days of improvement, Lucy this morning had gone back a bit. Mrs. Westerner was naturally anxious. I told her that my old master, Van Helsing, was staying with me, and that I would put her in his charge conjointly with myself, so now we can come and go without alarming her. If you do not hear from me, take it for granted that I am simply waiting for news. In haste, yours ever, John Seward. Dr. Seward's Diary 7th of September when Van Helsing and I arrived at Hillingham, we were met by Mrs. Westenra and shown up to Lucy's room. If I was shocked when I saw her yesterday, I was horrified when I saw her today. She was ghastly, chalkily pale. Her breathing was painful to see. Van Helsing beckoned to me, and we went gently out of the room. There is no time to be lost, he said. There must be transfusion of blood at once. Is it you or me? I am younger, Professor. It must be me. As we were speaking, Arthur arrived. I introduced him to the Professor, and Van Helsing's eyes gleamed. Sir, you have come in time. Your dear Miss wants blood. John was to give his, but now you are here, you are better. Arthur turned to him and said, If you only knew how gladly I would die for her. Good boy, said Van Helsing. Come. We all went up to Lucy's room, and with swiftness, Van Helsing performed the operation. As the transfusion went on, life seemed to come back to poor Lucy's cheeks. Presently, the professor said, What do you make of that? he asked. I bent closer to examine it. Just over the external jugular vein, there were two punctures. I can make nothing of it, I said. The professor stood up. I must go back to Amsterdam tonight he said. There are books and things there which I want. You must remain here. Keep watch all night and see that nothing disturbs her. I shall be back as soon as possible, and then we may begin. Begin? I said. What on earth do you mean? We shall see, he answered, as he hurried out. 8th of September. Towards dusk, Lucy awakened. I then made preparations for my long vigil. Lucy did not in any way make objection, but looked at me gratefully whenever I caught her eye. After a long spell of restlessness, she fell asleep. All night long she slept tranquilly and never stirred. In the morning I took myself back home, after sending a short wire to Van Helsing and to Arthur, telling them of the excellent result of the operation. Whilst I was at dinner, a telegram came from Van Helsing in Amsterdam suggesting that I should be again at Hillingham tonight and stating that he would join me early in the morning. 9th of September I was pretty tired when I got to Hillingham. When Lucy shook hands with me, she looked sharply in my face and said, No sitting up tonight for you. You are worn out. I am quite well again. She then took me upstairs and showed me a room next to her own, 
You must stay here, she said. I shall leave this door open. If I want anything, I shall call out. I could not but acquiesce. I lay on the sofa and forgot all about everything. 10th of September. I was conscious of the professor's hand on my head and awoke in a second. How is our patient? Well, when she left me, come, let us see, he said, and together we went into the room. The blind was down. As I raised it, I heard the professor's exclamation of horror. Gott in Himmel! On the bed, seemingly in a swoon, lay poor Lucy, more horribly white and wan-looking than ever. Van Helsing felt her heart. It is not too late, he said. Our work is undone. We must begin again. There is no young Arthur here now. I have to call on you this time, friend John. Without a moment's delay, we began the operation. As the transfer was made, I could see a faint tinge of colour fade back into the pallid cheeks and lips. Lucy slept well into the day, and when she woke she was fairly well and strong, though not nearly so much so as the day before. When Van Helsing had seen her, he went out for a walk. I could hear his voice in the hall asking the way to the nearest telegraph office. When he returned, he said to me, Go home and make yourself strong. I shall stay here tonight and sit up with little miss. I got back here in time for a late dinner. 11th of September. This afternoon I went over to Hillingham, found Van Helsing in excellent spirits and Lucy much better. Shortly after I arrived, a big parcel from abroad came for the professor. He opened it and showed a great bundle of white flowers. These are for you. Miss Lucy, he said. They are medicines. Here Lucy made a wry face. Dr. Van Helsing, you are joking. These flowers are only common garlic. To my surprise, Van Helsing said sternly, I never jest. There is grim purpose in all I do. Then he went on more gently. Little miss, I only do for your good. There is much virtue in these common flowers. I shall place them in your room and make myself the wreath that you are to wear. Come, John, you shall help me deck the room with my Harlem garlic. We went into the bedroom, taking the flowers with us. Van Helsing fastened up the windows and latched them securely. Next, taking a handful of the flowers, he rubbed them all over the sashes, the jamb of the door, and round the fireplace. Professor, you puzzle me, I said. I would almost say you are working some spell to keep out an evil spirit. Perhaps I am, he answered quietly. Then he began to make a wreath of the garlic which, when Lucy was in bed, he himself fixed round her neck. The last words he said to her were, Take care you do not disturb it, and even if the room feels close, do not tonight open the window or the door. As we left the house, Van Helsing said, Tonight I can sleep in peace. Tomorrow morning early you call for me and we will come together to see our pretty miss. 13th of September When Van Helsing and I arrived at Hillingham, Mrs. Westerner greeted us warmly and said, The dear child is still asleep. I was anxious about her in the night and went into her room. She was sleeping soundly, but the room was awfully stuffy. There were a lot of those... Horrible, strong-smelling flowers about everywhere. I took them all away and opened a window to let in a little fresh air. You will be pleased with her, I am sure. As she had spoken, the professor's face turned ashen grey. We went immediately to Lucy's room. Once again I drew the blind whilst Van Helsing went to the bed. The poor face had the same awful waxen pallor as before. As I expected, he murmured. Without a word, he began to set out on the little table the instruments for yet another transfusion of blood. Today, you must operate, he said. I shall provide. Again the operation, again some return of the colour to the ashy cheeks and the regular breathing of healthy sleep. When we had concluded, Van Helsing took Mrs. Westner aside and told her that she must never remove anything from Lucy's room without consulting him. Then he took over the care of the case himself, saying that he would watch this night and the next and would send me word when to come. Lucy Westenra's Diary 17th of September Four days and nights of peace. I am getting strong again, and the bad dreaming seems to have passed away. 
I have grown quite fond of the garlic, and a boxful arrives for me every day from Harlem. Tonight Dr. Van Helsing is going away for a day to Amsterdam. Thank God I am well enough to be left alone. The Pall Mall Gazette, 18th of September. The Escaped Wolf. At around midnight yesterday, a great grey Norwegian wolf escaped from its cage at the zoological gardens under mysterious circumstances. The bars of the cage had been broken and twisted, possibly by raiders, for earlier in the evening a tall man was seen lurking around the cages. Whatever the point of the raid, it must have miscarried, as the following morning the wolf returned of its own accord and offered itself up to the keepers. Whilst on the loose, the poor creature had suffered some accident, as its head was cut and the fur full of broken glass. The wounds, however, were not serious, and the fierce beast is once again on view in its cage. Telegram, Van Helsing, Antwerp, to Seaward, Carfax. Sent to wrong address and delivered late by 22 hours. 17th of September. Do not fail to be at Hillingham tonight. Very important. Shall be with you tomorrow morning. Memorandum left by Lucy Westenra. 17th of September. Night. This is an exact record of what took place tonight. I have barely strength to write, but it must be done. I went to bed as usual and soon fell asleep. I was waked by the flapping at the window, which now I know so well. I was not afraid, but I did wish that Dr. Seward was in the next room, as Dr. Van Helsing said he would be. Then outside in the shrubbery, I heard a sort of howl, like a dog's, but fiercer and deeper. I went to the window and looked out, but could see nothing except a big bat, which had evidently been buffeting its wings against the window. I went back to bed again, determined to keep awake. Presently Mother came in to see that I was all right. I feared she might catch cold sitting there, and asked her to lay down beside me. After a while there was the low howl again out in the shrubbery, and then a crash at the window. In the aperture of the broken panes was the head of a great grey wolf. Mother cried out, and struggled into a sitting posture, pointing at the wolf. Then there was a horrible gurgling in her throat, and she fell over. I kept my eyes fixed on the window. The wolf drew his head back, and then a whole myriad of little specks seemed to come blowing in, wheeling and circling round like a pillar of dust. Now I am alone, with dear mother's lifeless body. The air seems full of specks. I shall hide this paper in my breast. Goodbye, dear Arthur. God help me. It is enough. I will look to her, John. Take down our brave young lover and let him lie down a while. He must then go home and rest. When I got back to the room, Lucy was sleeping gently, and her breathing was stronger. By the bedside sat Van Helsing. As I approached, he leaned forward and loosened the black velvet band which she seemed always to wear round her neck, revealing a red mark. Dr. Seward's Diary, 18th of September. After receiving Van Helsing's delayed telegram this morning, I drove at once to Hillingham, left my cab at the gate and walked up the avenue alone. Seconds later, another cab arrived, and Van Helsing ran up to join me. When we reached the house, we knocked and rang, but there was no response. Passing around to the back, we forced a kitchen window and let ourselves in. Then we ascended to Lucy's room. How shall I describe what we saw? On the bed lay Lucy and her mother. Mrs. Weston was dead, her face with a look of terror frozen upon it. By her side lay Lucy, white and drawn. Her throat was bare, showing the wounds we had noticed before, but now looking horribly white and mangled. Without a word, the professor bent over the bed. It is not yet too late, he cried, leaping to his feet. Quick, quick! 
We carried Lucy into another room, laid her in bed, and forced a few drops of brandy down her throat. I noticed that Van Helsing tied a soft silk handkerchief round her throat. She was still unconscious and was worse than we had ever seen her. She must have another transfusion of blood, he said. You are exhausted already. I am exhausted too. What are we to do for someone who will open his veins for her? What's the matter with me, anyhow? The voice came from the doorway, and its tones brought joy to my heart, for they were those of Quincy Morris. Quincy, I cried, what brought you here? He handed me a telegram from Arthur, urging him to come to Hillingham, and to send him word of Lucy's condition. I think I came just in the nick of time, he said, with a tense smile. Once again we went through that ghastly operation. This time her body did not respond to the treatment as on the other occasions. Her struggle back into life was frightful to see and hear. When we had finished, I took Quincy downstairs to restore himself. When I returned, I found Van Helsing with a sheet or two of notepaper in his hand. He handed me the paper, saying only, It dropped from Lucy's breast when we carried her here. I read it. In God's name, what does it all mean? Is she mad? Do not trouble about it now. You shall understand it all in good time. The next few hours were filled with organizing the formalities of Mrs. Westerner's death. I sent a telegram to Arthur telling him that Mrs. Westerner was dead, that Lucy also had been ill but was now better, and that Van Helsing and Quincy and I were with her. The professor never moved from his seat at Lucy's side. When she woke late in the afternoon, Lucy's eye first lit on Van Helsing and on me, and gladdened. Then, seeing where she was, she gave a loud cry and wept weakly for a long time. Towards dusk, she fell into a doze. 19th of September. All last night, Lucy slept fitfully. The professor and I never left her for a moment unattended. When the day came, its searching light showed the ravages in poor Lucy's strength. When she slept, her open mouth showed the pale gums drawn back from the teeth, which looked longer and sharper than usual. When she woke, the softness of her eyes changed the expression, and she looked her own self, although a dying one. In the afternoon she asked for Arthur, and we telegraphed for him. Quincy went off to meet him at the station. When he arrived and saw her, Arthur was choked with emotion, and none of us could speak. It is now nearly one o'clock, and he and Van Helsing are sitting with her. I am to relieve them in a quarter of an hour. I fear that tomorrow will end our watching, for the shock has been too great. God help us all. 20th of September. I duly relieved Van Helsing in his watch over Lucy. We wanted Arthur to rest also. He refused at first, but finally agreed to go. At six o'clock, Van Helsing came to relieve me. When he saw Lucy's face, he bent down and lifted the silk handkerchief from her throat. My God! He croaked. I bent over and looked too and a chill came over me. The wounds on the throat had absolutely disappeared. Van Helsing stood looking at her. Then he turned to me. She is dying. It will not be long now. Wake that poor boy and let him come and see the last. I went to the dining room and waked Arthur. I told him as gently as I could that both Van Helsing and I feared that the end was near. When we came into Lucy's room, she opened her eyes, and seeing him, whispered softly, Arthur, my love, I am so glad you have come. Arthur took her hand and knelt beside her. Gradually her eyes closed, and she sank into sleep. Then came a strange change. Her breathing grew stertorous. 
the mouth opened, and the pale gums, drawn back, made the teeth look longer and sharper than ever. In a sort of sleep-waking, unconscious way, she opened her eyes, which were now dull and hard, and said in a soft, voluptuous voice, Arthur, my love, kiss me. Arthur bent to kiss her, but at that instant Van Helsing swooped upon him and with both hands dragged him back. Not for your life, he said, not for your living soul and hers. And he stood between them like a lion at bay. Arthur was so taken aback that he did not for a moment know what to do or say. I kept my eyes fixed on Lucy. A spasm as of rage flitted over her face. Then her eyes closed, and she breathed heavily. Shortly after, she opened her eyes in all their softness, and putting out her pale, thin hand, took Van Helsing's great brown one. Drawing it to her, she kissed it. My true friend, she said in a faint voice. My true friend and his. Oh, guard him and give him peace. I swear it, he said solemnly. Then he turned to Arthur. Come, my child. Take her hand in yours, and kiss her on the forehead. Their eyes met instead of their lips, and so they parted. Lucy's eyes closed, and soon her breathing ceased. It is all over, said Van Helsing. She is dead. The funeral was arranged so that Lucy and her mother might be buried together. I attended to all the ghastly formalities. I noticed that Van Helsing never kept far away from the death chamber. There were no relatives, and as Arthur had to return for his father's funeral, we took it upon ourselves to examine papers, etc. Van Helsing insisted upon looking over Lucy's papers himself. I asked him why. There may be papers more such as this, he said producing the memorandum which had been in Lucy's breast. When we had finished our work, he said to me, And now, friend John, to bed. Tomorrow we shall have much to do, but for tonight there is no need of us, alas. Arthur was expected at five o'clock the following afternoon. The professor motioned me to bring him upstairs. I did so. And as we reached the room, Arthur took my arm. Together we moved to the bed and stared at the beautiful face before us under the tall wax candles. All Lucy's loveliness had come back to her in death. Mina Harker's journal, 22nd of September. In the train from London to Exeter, Jonathan sleeping. We came to town this morning on business, and after it was completed we walked down Piccadilly. I was looking at a very beautiful girl, sitting in a Victoria outside Giuliano's, when I felt Jonathan clutch my arm. My God, he said under his breath. In terror and amazement, he gazed at a tall, thin man with a black moustache and a pointed beard, who was also observing the pretty girl. His face was hard and cruel, and his big white teeth were pointed like an animal's. I asked Jonathan why he was disturbed, and he answered... Do you see who it is? It is the Count. But he has grown young. Oh, my God, if this be so. The lady then drove off, and the dark man hailed a hansom and followed in the same direction. Jonathan kept staring after him. I feared to keep his mind on the subject by asking him questions, but I must somehow learn the facts of his journey abroad. The time is come, I fear, when I must take up the notebook and know what is written. Jonathan will forgive me if I do wrong. It is for his own dear sake. Later, at home, Jonathan still pale and dizzy, and now a telegram from Van Helsing, whoever he may be. You will be grieved to hear that Mrs. Westenra died five days ago. 
and that Lucy died the day before yesterday. They were both buried today. Dr. Seward's diary, 22nd of September. It is all over. Lucy lies in the tomb of her kin in a lonely churchyard on Hampstead Hill. The romance of my life is told. I go back to take up the thread of my life work, sadly and without hope. The Westminster Gazette, 25th of September. A Hampstead mystery. In Hampstead, during the past two or three days, several cases have occurred of young children neglecting to return from playing on the heath. It has always been late in the evening when they've been missed, and the children were not found until the following morning. It appears that all of the children have been wounded in the throat, possibly by a small animal. Another child was discovered this morning at the Shooter's Hill side of Hampstead Heath. It has the same tiny wound in the throat. Mina Harker's Journal, 23rd of September. Jonathan is better after a bad night. I am glad that he has work to keep his mind occupied. He will be away till late, so I shall take his foreign journal to my room and read it. 24th of September. Jonathan's terrible record upset me greatly. Poor dear! How he must have suffered, whether it be true or only imagination. And yet that man we saw yesterday, he seemed quite certain of him, and there does seem to be some thread of continuity. That fearful Count was coming to London, and if he came to London with its teeming millions, there may be a solemn duty. I shall get my typewriter and begin transcribing. Then we shall be ready for other eyes, if required. Letter, Van Helsing, to Mrs. Harker. 24th of September. Dear Madam, I am empowered to read the letters and papers of Miss Lucy Westenra, for I am deeply concerned about certain matters vitally important. In them I find some letters from you, which show what great friends you were and how you loved her. Madam Mina, I implore you to help me. It is for others' good that I ask. May I see you? You can trust me. I am a friend of Dr. John Seward and of Lord Godalming, Miss Lucy's Arthur. I should come to Exeter at once if you tell me I can. Forgive me. Van Helsing. Telegram, Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing. 25th of September. Come today, can see you any time you call. Wilhelmina Harker. Mina Harker's Journal. 25th of September. It was half past two o'clock when Dr. Van Helsing was announced. Mrs. Harker, he said. I bowed and held out my hand. He took it and said, Madam Mina, I know that you were with Miss Lucy at Whitby. She sometimes kept a diary, and in that diary she refers to a sleepwalking in which you saved her. Can you tell me all of it that you remember? I wrote it all down at the time. I can show it to you if you like, Dr. Van Helsing. I took up the typewritten copy and handed it to him. His eyes glistened. You are so good, he said. May I read it now? By all means. He bowed and settled himself in a chair and became absorbed in the papers. I left the room in order that he might not be disturbed. When I came back, he rushed up and took me by both hands. Madam Mina, he said excitedly, how can I say what I owe to you? This paper is as sunshine. It opens the gate to me. If ever Abraham van Helsing can do anything for you or yours, I trust you will let me serve you. And now your husband. Tell me of him. Is he quite well? Is all that fever gone? I saw here an opportunity to ask him about Jonathan. So I said, he was almost recovered, but when we were in town on Thursday, he had a sort of shock and was greatly upset. A shock? What kind of shock? He thought he saw someone who recalled something terrible something which led to his brain fever. I hesitated to go on, but I trusted him, so I said, Dr. Van Helsing, if you will let me, I shall give you another typewritten paper to read. It is the copy of Jonathan's journal when abroad. I dare not say anything of it. Read it for yourself and judge. Then you can tell me what you think. I promise, he said as I gave him the papers. 
I shall stay in Exeter tonight, and in the morning I shall come to see you and your husband, if I may. Jonathan will be here in the morning. You must come to breakfast with us, and see him then. So he took the papers and went away. Letter by hand, Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker, 25th of September, 6 o'clock. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's diary. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. But he is a noble fellow and not one to be injured in permanence by a shock. His brain and his heart are all right, so be at rest. Yours most faithfully, Abraham van Helsing. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 26th of September. When I got home last night, Mina told me of van Helsing's visit and of her having given him the two diaries copied out. She showed me in the doctor's letter that all I wrote down was true. Now I am not afraid, even of the Count. He has succeeded, after all, then, in getting to London. When Van Helsing arrived this morning, I introduced myself. Madam Mina told me you were ill, he said, that you had had a shock. I smiled. I was ill, but you have cured me by your letter to Mina last night. I was in doubt, and did not even trust the evidence of my own senses. Now I know, thanks to you. Professor, does what you have to do concern the Count? It does. Then I am with you heart and soul. After breakfast, I saw him to the station. I had got him the London papers of the previous night, and while we were waiting for the train to start, he was turning them over. Suddenly, he grew quite white. Mein Gott, he groaned. So soon. Then the whistle blew and the train moved off. Leaning out of the window, he called, Love to Madame Mina. I shall write soon. Dr. Seward's Diary, 26th of September. When Van Helsing returned today from Exeter, he thrust last night's Westminster Gazette into my hand. What do you think of that? he asked, pointing out a paragraph about children being decoyed away at Hampstead. There was a passage which described small punctured wounds on their throats. I looked up. Simply that whatever it was that injured Lucy has injured them. That is true indirectly, but not directly. How do you mean, Professor? I asked. Do you mean to tell me, friend John, that you have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of, not after all the hints given? Of nervous prostration following on great loss or waste of blood. And how was the blood lost or wasted? I shook my head. He sat down beside me. You are a clever man, friend John, but you are too prejudiced. Do you know all the mystery of life and death? For example, did you know that in some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on the trees all day, and when sailors sleep on the deck at night, from the heat, flit down on them, and in the morning are found dead men, white, as even Miss Lucy was? Good God, Professor, I said, starting up. Do you mean to tell me that Lucy was bitten by such a bat? He waved his hand for silence. You think those small holes in the children's throats were made by the same that made the hole in Miss Lucy? I suppose so. Then you are wrong. They were made by Miss Lucy. My friend, I know that you love that sweet lady. Even yet I do not expect you to believe, but tonight I go to prove it. Dare you come with me? I'll tell you what I propose. First, that we go off now and see that child in the hospital. The doctor there is a friend of mine. And then... And then... He took a key from his pocket and held it up. And then we spend the night, you and I, in the churchyard where Lucy lies. This is the key that unlocks the tomb. We found the child awake at the hospital. It had slept and taken food, and altogether was going on well. The doctor showed us the punctures. There was no mistaking the similarity to those on Lucy's throat. At ten o'clock, we made our way to the churchyard, through deserted streets lit by scattered lamps, and climbed the churchyard wall. With some difficulty, for it was very dark, 
we found the western tomb. Van Helsing went about his work systematically, holding his candle so that he could read the coffin plates. He made assurance of Lucy's coffin and began taking out the screws. Finally, he lifted off the lid. The coffin was empty. He put on the coffin lid again, gathered up all his things, and blew out the light. We opened the door and went out, locking the door behind us. Then he told me to watch at one side of the churchyard, whilst he would watch at the other. I took up my place behind a yew tree, and I saw his dark figure move until the trees hid it from my sight. Suddenly, something white moved between the yew trees at the far side of the churchyard. From the professor's side, I saw a dark mass hurrying towards it. Then I too moved, stumbling over graves. A little way off, a white, dim figure flitted in the direction of the tomb. Then it disappeared. I continued on and found the professor holding in his arms a tiny child. Are you satisfied now? Do you see this child? Yes, I said. But who brought it here? And is it wounded? The child's throat was without a scratch. We were just in time, said he thankfully. We decided to take the child to the heath, and when we heard a policeman coming, to leave it where he would not fail to find it. This we successfully did, and by good chance got a cab and drove to town. Van Helsing is to call for me at noon. He insists that I shall go with him on another expedition. 27th of September At two o'clock we stood again outside Lucy's tomb. Dr. Van Helsing opened the vault and again motioned me to proceed. The place was unutterably mean-looking as the sun streamed in. Van Helsing again unscrewed the coffin lid and lifted it back. A shock of dismay shot through me. There lay Lucy, more radiantly beautiful than ever. Reaching out his hand, the professor pulled back the dead lips to show the white teeth. See, he said, they are even sharper than before. With these, the little children can be bitten. Are you of belief now, friend John? It began to dawn upon me that I was accepting Van Helsing's theories. Now let us go, he said presently. Tomorrow night you will come to my hotel at ten o'clock. I shall send for Arthur to come too, and also that fine young American that gave his blood. Later, we shall all have work to do. So we locked the tomb and came away. 29th of September, morning. At ten o'clock last night, Arthur and Quincy joined the professor and I in his room. Addressing himself especially to Arthur, he said gravely, I want you to come with me in secret to the churchyard where poor Lucy is buried. Arthur's face fell. And when there? To enter the tomb. And when in the tomb? To open the coffin. Dr. Van Helsing, this is too much, Arthur said angrily. I am willing to be patient in all things that are reasonable, but this would it not be well to hear what I have to say, interrupted Van Helsing. Miss Lucy is dead, is it not so? Then there can be no wrong to her, but if she be not dead, good God, Arthur cried. Has she been buried alive? I did not say she was alive. I go no further than to say that she might be undead. Undead? What do you mean? There are mysteries which men can only guess at. Believe me, we are now on the verge of one. But I have not done. May I cut off the head of dead Miss Lucy? Heavens and earth, no, cried Arthur. Not for the wide world. Dr. Van Helsing, I have a duty to protect her grave from outrage, and by God I shall do it. Van Helsing rose up gravely. My Lord Godalming, he said, I too have a duty to do. To the dead, and by God, I shall do it. All I ask is that you come with me, and look, and listen. In a long life I have never had so heavy a task as now. I came here to help a sweet young lady whom I came to love. I gave to her my nights and days before and after death. And if my death 
can do her good even now. She shall have it freely. Arthur, much affected, took the old man's hand. I cannot understand, but at least I will go with you and wait. It was a quarter before twelve when we reached the tomb. The professor unlocked the door and we entered. He then lit a dark lantern and pointed to the coffin, saying to me, You were with me here yesterday. Was the body of Miss Lucy in that coffin? It was. You hear, the professor said. Then with his screwdriver he again took off the lid of the coffin. Arthur looked on, very pale, but silent. When the lid was removed, he stepped forward. The coffin was empty. For several minutes no one spoke. The silence was broken by Quincy Morris. Professor, is this your doing? I swear to you that I have not removed nor touched her. What happened was this. Van Helsing recounted the events of the last two days. So it is he concluded, that we find this coffin empty, but bear with me. Wait with me outside, and things much stranger are yet to be. Shutting the dark slide of his lantern, he opened the door, and we filed out, he coming last and locking the door behind him. Arthur and Quincy were silent, and were, I could see, striving to grasp the meaning of the mystery. In respectful silence we took the places assigned to us by the professor, close round the tomb, hidden from anyone approaching. Far down the avenue of yews we saw a dim white figure advance, holding something at its breast. A ray of moonlight showed in startling prominence a dark-haired woman dressed in the sediments of the grave, bending over a fair-haired child. I could hear the gasp of Arthur, as we recognized the features of Lucy Westenra. Obedient to Van Helsing's gesture, we all four stepped forward before the door of the tomb. Van Helsing raised his lantern and drew the slide. By the light that fell on Lucy's face, we could see that the lips were crimson with fresh blood that trickled over her chin. The thing drew back with an angry snarl, her eyes full of hellfire. Then the face became wreathed in a voluptuous smile. With a careless motion, she flung the child to the ground where it lay moaning. Then she advanced towards Arthur with outstretched arms, saying, Come to me, Arthur. My arms are hungry for you. Come, my husband. Arthur seemed under a spell. Moving his hands from his face, he opened wide his arms. She was leaping for them when Van Helsing sprang forward and held between them his crucifix. She recoiled from it, with a face suddenly distorted with rage. Van Helsing closed the lantern, dropped the crucifix, and stepped back. In horrified amazement, we watched the woman rush past us, and with a body seemingly as real as our own, pass in through the interstices of the closed tomb doorway where scarce a knife blade could have gone. Come, my friends, said the professor, lifting the child. Tomorrow at noon we shall all come again. Then there is more to do. As for this little one... He is not much harmed, and by tomorrow night he shall be well. We shall leave him where the police will find him, and then to home. 29th of September, night. We got to the churchyard by half-past one. Silently we followed the professor to the tomb. He unlocked the door, and we entered, closing it behind us. Again he lifted the lid off Lucy's coffin. The body lay there in all its death beauty. It seemed like a nightmare of Lucy. The pointed teeth, the blood-stained voluptuous mouth, a devilish mockery of Lucy's sweet purity. I could see Arthur's face grow hard as he looked. Van Helsing, in his methodical manner, began removing the contents from his bag, first his operating knives, then a round wooden stake, one end of which was sharpened to a fine point. With the stake came a heavy hammer. When all was ready, Van Helsing said, Before we do anything, let me tell you this. The career of this unhappy lady is but just begun. Those children whose blood she suck are not yet much harmed. But if she live on, undead, 
more and more they lose their blood, and by her power over them, they become like her. But if she die in truth, then all cease. The tiny wounds of the throat disappear, and they go back to their playing, unknowing of what has been. But most blessed of all, when this now undead be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady we love shall again be free to take her place with the other angels. So, my friends, it will be a blessed hand that shall strike the blow that sets her free. To this I am willing. But is there none amongst us who has a better right? We all looked at Arthur, who stepped forward and said, My friend, I thank you. Tell me what I am to do, and I shall not falter. Take the stake in your left hand, and the hammer in your right. Then, when I begin to read the prayer for the dead, strike in God's name. Arthur took up the stake and the hammer. Van Helsing opened his missal and began to read. Arthur placed the point over the heart and struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin writhed, and a hideous blood-curdling screech came from the open red lips. The body shook and twisted in wild contortions, and the mouth was smeared with crimson foam. Arthur's untrembling arm rose and fell, driving the stake deeper and deeper, whilst the blood welled and spurted up around it. And then the writhing of the body became less, and the face ceased to quiver. Finally, it lay still. The terrible task was over. Arthur reeled and would have fallen had we not caught him. When we again looked towards the coffin, a murmur of startled surprise ran amongst us. There in the coffin lay no longer the foul thing that we had so dreaded. But Lucy, with her face of unequalled sweetness and purity, Van Helsing laid his hand on Arthur's shoulder. My friend, am I not forgiven? Arthur took the old man's hand in his and pressed it. Forgiven. God bless you that you have given my dear one her soul again. And me, peace. Arthur bent and kissed her and we sent him and Quincy out of the tomb. The professor and I then cut off the head and filled the mouth with garlic. We screwed on the coffin lid and, gathering up our belongings, came away. Outside, the sun shone and birds sang. Before we moved off, Van Helsing said, My friends, one step of our work is done, but there remains a greater task to find the author of all this sorrow, and to stamp him out. It will be a long task, and there is danger in it. Shall you not all help me? Each in turn took his hand, and the promise was made. Then said the professor, Tonight I leave for Amsterdam, but shall return tomorrow. Two nights hence you shall meet with me and friend John and two others that you know not as yet. And then begins our great quest. At his hotel, Van Helsing found a telegram waiting for him. Am coming up by train, Jonathan at Whitby. Important news, Mina Harker. The professor was delighted. Ah, that wonderful Madam Mina, he said. She must go to your house, friend John. You must meet her at the station. Telegraph her en route so that she may be prepared. When the wire was dispatched, he told me of a diary kept by Jonathan Harker when abroad, and gave me a typewritten copy of it, and also of Mrs. Harker's diary at Whitby. Take these, he said, and study them well. Then you will be master of all the facts. He then made ready for his departure, and I took my way to Paddington, where I arrived just before the train came in. As the crowd melted away, a sweet-faced, dainty-looking girl stepped up to me. Dr. Seward, is it not? And you were Mrs. Harker? I answered. 
whereupon she held out her hand. I got her luggage, which included a typewriter, and we made our way to Perfleet. In due time we arrived. I had sent a wire to have rooms prepared. Mrs. Harker left me to refresh herself, saying that she would presently come to my study, as she had much to say. As yet I have not had the chance of looking at the papers which Van Helsing left with me, though they lie open before me. Mina Harker's Journal 29th of September After I had tidied myself, I went down to Dr. Seward's study and knocked at the door. I hope I did not keep you waiting, I said, entering. Not at all, he replied with a smile. I was only entering my diary. Your diary? Dr. Seward, you helped to attend dear Lucy at the last. Let me read how she died. She was very dear to me. To my surprise, he answered, No, not for the wide world would I let you know of that terrible story. Just then I noticed the typewriting on his table. Dr. Seward, you do not know me, I said. When you have read those papers, my own diary, and my husband's, you will know me better. I must not expect you yet to trust me so far. He stood up and said, You are quite right. I did not trust you because I did not know you. But I should have known you. I know that Lucy told you of me. She told me of you too. May I make the only atonement in my power? Take the diary and read all of it. Then you will know me better. In the meantime, I shall read over these documents. Now I am in my sitting room, ready to begin. Dr. Seward's Diary, 29th of September. I had just finished the two diaries when Mrs. Harker came in, carrying her typewriter, her eyes flushed with crying. I fear I have distressed you, I said, as gently as I could. I have been more touched than I can say by your grief, she replied. Through all that multitude of horrors shone one holy ray of light. Our dear Lucy is at last at peace. Drying her eyes, she went on, See, I have tried to be useful. I have started to copy out the words on my typewriter. Need anyone else ever read them? Yes, they must. But why? Because in our struggle to rid the earth of this terrible monster, we must have all the knowledge and help we can get. I think that in your record there are many lights to this dark mystery. You will let me help, will you not? Let me copy all this out now. We must be ready for Dr. Van Helsing when he comes. I have sent a telegram to Jonathan at Whitby, where he has gone to get more information. He will be here tomorrow to help us. You tell me that Lord Godalming and Mr. Morris are coming too. Let us be able to share this with them when they come. She looked at me so appealingly and with such resolution in her bearing that I gave in at once to her wishes. Taking the cover off her typewriter, she began to typewrite three copies of the diary. 30th of September Mr. Harker arrived at nine o'clock. After lunch, he and his wife went back to their room. As I passed a while ago, I heard the click of the typewriter. Harker has brought the letters between the consignee of the box at Whitby and the carriers in London who took charge of it. Strange that it never struck me that the very next house might be the Count's hiding place. Goodness knows that we had enough clues from the conduct of the patient Renfield. Harker is now reading the typescript of my diary. He says that by dinner time they will be able to show a whole connected narrative. Later. Godalming and Quincy Morris have arrived, and Mrs. Harker has given them copies of the various diaries and letters to study. After they had gone, Mrs. Harker said, Dr. Seward, may I ask a favour? I want to see your patient, Mr. Renfield. What you have said in your diary interests me so much. She looked so appealing that I could not refuse her. We found Renfield sitting placidly with his hands folded. Mrs. Harker walked over to him, and, smilingly pleasant, held out her hand. "'Good afternoon, Mr. Renfield,' said she. "'I am Mrs. Harker.' Renfield eyed her intently, with a frown on his face. "'What are you doing here?' "'My husband and I are visiting Dr. Seward.' Then don't stay. But why not? I thought this conversation might not be pleasant to Mrs. Harker, 
and as it was time for me to meet Van Helsing, I told her it was time to leave. She came at once, saying pleasantly to Renfield, Goodbye. I hope I may see you again. To my astonishment, he replied, Goodbye, my dear. I pray God I may never see your sweet face again. May he bless and keep you. Then I went to the station to meet Van Helsing. As we drove back, I told him of the arrival of Arthur and Quincy, and of how my own diary had come to be of some use through Mrs. Harker's suggestion. Ah, that wonderful Madame Mina, rejoined the professor. Friend John, after tonight, she must not have to do with this terrible affair. It is not good that she run a risk so great. I heartily agreed with him. Then I told him what we had found in his absence, that the house which Dracula had bought was the very next one to my own. He was amazed and fell into a long silence. When we arrived, the professor took away one copy of all the records to study before our meeting, which is fixed for nine o'clock. Mina Harker's Journal, 30th of September. When we met in Dr. Seawood's study after dinner, Professor Van Helsing took the head of the table and said, Now that we are all acquainted with the facts that are in these papers, I think it is good that I tell you something of the kind of enemy with which we have to deal. There are such beings as vampires. The teachings and the records of the past give proof of it. He is known everywhere. The people fear him to this day, and their beliefs are justified by what we ourselves have seen. The Nosferatu does not die. He lives on the blood of the living. What is more, he can even grow younger, but he cannot flourish without this diet, for he eats not as others. He throws no shadow. He makes in the mirror no reflection. He has the strength of twenty men, the cunning of ages, and the aids of necromancy. He can appear as a wolf, or bat, as mist, or even as elemental dust on moonlight rays. He can direct the elements. He can command the bat and the wolf. He can grow and become small. He can at times vanish, and he can see in the dark. How then? Are we to destroy him? Hear me through. He can do all these things, yet he is not free. He cannot enter anywhere unless someone first bids him to come. His power ceases at the coming of the day, and there are other things which so afflict him, the garlic that we know, and things sacred, like my crucifix. As for the stake through him, we know already of his peace and the cut-off head that giveth rest. We have seen it with our eyes. Thus, when we find the monster's coffin, we can destroy him, if we obey what we know. Now, we must lay our campaign. We know from Jonathan that from the castle to Whitby came a great box which was delivered at Carfax. Our first step must be to ascertain whether it remains in the house or has been removed. For you, Madam Mina, this night is the end until all be well. We shall act more free knowing that you are not in danger. They have now gone off to Carfax with means to get into the house. They have told me to go to bed and sleep. I shall try, lest Jonathan have added anxiety about me when he returns. Dr. Seward's diary. 1st of October, 4 a.m. As we were about to leave, an urgent message was brought to me from Renfield to know if I would see him at once. Dr. Van Helsing and the others asked to accompany me, to which I agreed. We found him in a considerable state of excitement. He threw himself on his knees and wrung his hands in plaintive supplication. Dr. Seward, let me out of this house at once. Send me away how you will, where you will, in a straight waistcoat, manacled and leg ironed, even to jail, but let me out. You don't know what you do by keeping me here. By all you hold sacred, save my soul from guilt. Let me go. I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said sternly. Get to your bed and try to behave more discreetly. He suddenly stopped and looked intently at me for several moments. Then he sat down on the bed, saying, in a quiet voice, You will, I trust, Dr. Seward, do me the justice to remember that I did what I could to convince you tonight. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 
1st of October, 5 a.m. We left Renfield's room and made our way, silently, towards the Carfax mansion, taking care to keep in the shadows of the trees. When we got to the porch, Van Helsing opened his bag. My friends, we are going into a terrible danger. We must guard ourselves. Keep this near your heart. As he spoke, he handed to each of us a little silver crucifix. Next, these small electric lamps. And finally this, which we must not desecrate needlessly. This was a portion of sacred wafer, which he had put into envelopes and handed to each of us. Dr. Seward tried one or two skeleton keys. Presently the bolt yielded and shot back. We pressed on the door. The rusty hinges creaked, and it slowly opened. In manus tuus domine, the professor said, crossing himself. And we passed over the threshold, closing the door behind us. We lit our lamps. The whole place was thick with dust and spider's webs. On a table in the hall was a great bunch of keys. The professor lifted them and turned to me. You know this place, Jonathan. Which way to the chapel? I led the way and eventually found myself opposite an arched oaken door. We found the key on the bunch and opened it. We made an accurate examination of the place. The great box was not there. Closing the door again, we locked it and began searching the house. We found nothing except dust. When we emerged again from the front, Dr. Van Helsing said, So far, no harm has come to us. We have ascertained that the box is missing. We must search for it, then... We shall make our final coup. Now, let us go home. Dr. Seward's Diary 2nd of October Upon our return from Carfax House, an attendant rushed up to tell me that Renfield had somehow met with an accident. We all went at once. When we came to Renfield's room, we found him lying on the floor in a pool of blood, his face horribly bruised. Presently, Renfield's eyes opened. He moved convulsively and said, Doctor, I have had a terrible dream. I must not deceive myself. It was not a dream. Doctor, I have but a few minutes. I have something that I must say before I die. It was after you left me tonight when I implored you to let me go away. Go on, Van Helsing said in a low voice. He came up to the window in the mist, as I had seen him often before, and his eyes were fierce with anger. He was laughing, and his sharp teeth glinted in the moonlight when he turned to look back towards his house. I, I, I wouldn't ask him to come in at first, though I knew he wanted to. Then he began promising me things, <laughs> before I knew what I was doing, I found myself saying to him, Come in, master. He slid into the room through the sash, though it was only open an inch. Renfield's voice was growing weaker. Then I knew why he had come. Mrs. Harker, he wanted to take the life out of her. It made me mad, and I grabbed him tightly. Then I saw his eyes. They burned into me. I, I tried to cling to him, but he raised me up and flung me down. Then there was a, a red cloud before me, and the mist seemed to steal away under the door. His voice was becoming fainter, and his breath more stertorous. Van Helsing stood up. We all had it upstairs. Outside the Harker's bedroom, Van Helsing said, My friends, if the door does not open, put your shoulders down and shove. Now! He turned the handle, but the door did not yield. We threw ourselves against it. With a crash, it burst open, and we fell headlong into the room. What I saw in the moonlit room appalled me. Kneeling on the edge of the bed was the white-clad figure of Mrs. Harker. By her side stood a tall man in black, the Count. With his left hand, he held both Mrs. Harker's hands. His right hand gripped her by the back of the neck, forcing her face down on his bosom. 
Her white nightdress was smeared with blood, and a thin stream trickled down the man's bare breast. As we burst into the room, the Count turned, and a horrible style passed over his blood-smeared face. Callously, he threw his victim back upon the bed and spoke to us. You think to baffle me. You shall be sorry yet. Each one of you. My revenge is just begun. By this time, the professor was advancing towards him with the envelope which contained the sacred wafer. The Count cowered back. Suddenly the moonlight failed, and when the gaslight sprang up under Quincy's match, we saw nothing but a faint vapour trailing under the now closed door. Mrs. Harker now gave a scream so wild and so despairing that it will ring in my ears till my dying day. My God! Harker cried, moving to his wife. Has it come to this? Putting out his arms, he folded her to his breast where she lay sobbing. Godalming, who had left the room with the striking of the light, now returned, breathless. I could not see him anywhere in the passage, he said, or in any of the other rooms. I ran downstairs too and looked into Renfield's room. There was no trace there except, well, except the poor fellow is dead. For a couple of minutes there was silence. Then Van Helsing placed his hand tenderly on Mrs. Harker's head. Now, Madame Mina, tell us exactly what happened. The dear lady shivered and began. I went to bed. When you had all gone, I can't quite remember how I fell asleep. All was dark and silent. Then there was in the room a thin, white mist. Beside the bed, as if he had stepped out of the mist, stood a tall, thin man, all in black. I knew him at once. The waxen face, the high, aquiline nose, the red lips with the sharp, white teeth showing between. The red eyes. I would have screamed out, only I... I was paralyzed. With a mocking smile, he placed one hand upon my shoulder and bared my throat with the other, saying, First, a little refreshment to reward my exertions. And, oh my God, he placed his reeking lips upon my throat. I was in a half swoon and felt my strength fading away. How long this horrible thing lasted, I know not, but when he took his awful mouth away, I saw it drip with blood. Then he spoke mockingly. And so you, like the others, would frustrate me in my designs. You know now what it is to cross my path. You, the best beloved one, are now to me. Flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, and shall be later my companion. But still you are to be punished for what you have done, and to that end, this. With that he pulled open his shirt, and with his long, sharp nails opened a vein in his breast. When the blood began to spurt, he took my hands in one of his, holding them tight, and with the other seized my neck and pressed my mouth to the wound so that I must either suffocate or swallow some of Oh, my God, what have I done? God pity me. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 3rd of October. Breakfast was a strange meal to us all. When it was over, Van Helsing stood up and said, Madam Mina, you are quite safe here until the sunset but let me see you armed against personal attack. On your forehead, I touch this piece of sacred wafer in the name of the Father, the Son, and... There was a fearful scream. As he placed the wafer on Mina's forehead, it seared it, burning into the flesh as though it had been a piece of white-hot metal. My poor darling wailed out, Unclean! Unclean! Even the Almighty shuns my polluted flesh! I threw myself beside her and held her tight. Then Van Helsing said, It may be that you will have to bear that mark till God himself sees fit to take it from you. But, my dear Madame Mina, may we who love you be there to see when that red scar shall pass away and leave your forehead as pure as the heart we know. 3rd of October, evening. The day has seemed terribly long. This evening the professor fixed up our room against any coming of the vampire and assured Mina that she might rest in peace. 
Quincy Morris, Godalming, and Dr. Seawood have arranged to set up outside our door, dividing the night between them, to watch over the safety of my poor darling. So now to bed. 4th of October morning. During the night I was wakened by Mina, who said to me hurriedly, Go, call the professor. I want to see him at once. I have an idea. I went to the professor's room, and two or three minutes later, Van Helsing returned with me in his dressing gown. I want you to hypnotize me, she said to him. Do it before the dawn, for I feel that then I can speak and speak freely. Be quick, for the time is short. Without a word, he motioned her to sit up in bed. Looking fixedly at her, he commenced to make passes in front of her with his hands. Gradually her eyes closed, and she sat stock still. When she opened her eyes again, there was a faraway look in them, and a sad dreaminess, which was new to me. The professor motioned me to bring the others in from the hallway, where they had been anxiously waiting. Mina appeared not to see them. The stillness was broken by Van Helsing's voice, speaking in a low, level tone. Where are you? I do not know. It is all strange to me. What do you see? Nothing. It is all dark. What do you hear? The lapping of water. It is gurgling by, and little waves leap. I can hear them on the outside. Then you are on a ship? Yes. What else do you hear? The sound of men running about. There is the creaking of a chain and the check of the capstan as it falls into the ratchet. What are you doing? I am still. Oh, so still. It is like death. The voice faded away into a deep breath as of one sleeping, and the open eyes closed again. By this time the sun had risen, and we were all in the full light of day, Presently Mina awoke, eager to know what she had told. The professor repeated the conversation, then he said, My friends, that ship, wherever it was, was weighing anchor whilst she spoke. God be thanked. We know now what is in the Count's mind. He has taken his earth box on board a ship, and he has left the land. He thinks to escape, but we will follow him. Mina looked at him appealingly. But why? when he's gone away from us. My dear Madam Mina, he can live for centuries, and you are but mortal woman. He has infected you. Even if he do no more, you have only to live, and death will make you like him. This must not be. Time is now to be dreaded, since once he put that mark upon your throat. I was just in time to catch her as she fell forward in a faint. Mina Harker's Journal, 5th of October, 5 p.m. At our meeting this afternoon, Dr. Van Helsing described what steps were taken during the day to discover on what boat and with a band Count Dracula made his escape. As I knew that he wanted to get back to Transylvania, I felt sure that he must go by the way he came. So, we start to find what ships leave for the Black Sea last night. We go to your Lloyd's. And there we find that only one black sea-bound ship go out with the tide. She is the Tsarina Catherine, and she sailed from Doolittle's Wharf for Varna this morning. It will take her at least three weeks to reach Varna, but we can travel overland and be there well before the count, and be able to make such preparations as may be necessary. In Varna, we must be ready to act the instant the ship arrives. We shall board the ship, and when none are near to sea, we shall open the box. If the Count is there, Dr. Seaworth and I will cut off his head and drive a stake through his heart. If we can so treat the Count's body, it will soon after fall into dust. Now, let us put all our affairs in order. Tomorrow I shall make arrangement for our journey. Jonathan Harker's Journal 15th of October, Varna we left Charing Cross on the morning of the 12th, and in Paris took the places secured for us in the Orient Express. We travelled night and day, arriving here at about five o'clock. 
Godalming arranged before leaving London that Lloyd should send him every day a telegram saying if the ship had been reported or not, and so far she has not been reported from anywhere. Thank God Mina is well and looks to be getting stronger. It has become a habit for Van Helsing to hypnotize her before sunrise and sunset. He always asks her what she can see and hear. She answers to the first, nothing, all is dark. And to the second, I can hear water rushing by. Masts and yards creak. The wind is high. It is evident that the Tsarina Kathleen is still at sea, hastening to Varna. 16th of October. Mina's report? Still the same. When the Tsarina Kathleen passes the Dardanelles, we are sure to have some report. 17th of October. Everything is ready now. Godalming has arranged authorization to board the ship, to find the box, and to open it. We are to be informed by special messenger when the Tsarina Kathleen is seen. 24th of October. A whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams to Godalming, but only the same story. Not yet reported. Mina's hypnotic answer is unvaried. Lapping waves, rushing water, and creaking masts. Telegram, Lloyd's London, to Lord Godalming, Varna. October the 24th. Tsarina Catherine reported this morning from Dardanelles. Dr. Seward's diary. 24th of October. We were all wild with excitement today when Godalming got his telegram from Lloyd's. I know now what men feel in battle when the call to action is heard. The Tsarina Catherine should arrive sometime in the morning. We shall be ready. An hour ago I found Harker whetting the edge of the great Gurkha knife, which he now always carries with him. Wherever he may be in the Black Sea, the Count is hurrying to his doom. 26th October. No news yet of the ship's arrival. She ought to be here by now. Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report at sunrise was still the same. 27th of October, noon. Most strange, no news yet of the ship we wait for. Mrs. Harker reported this morning as usual, lapping waves and rushing water, though she added that the waves were very faint. The telegrams from London have been the same, no further report. Van Helsing fears the Count is escaping us. Telegram, Lloyd's London, to Lord Godalming, Varna. Tsarina Catherine reported entering Galatz at one o'clock today. Dr. Seward's diary. 29th October in the train from Varna to Galatz. After making hasty arrangements, we left Varna this morning and are due to arrive in Galatz after sunrise tomorrow. We are on fire with anxiety and eagerness. <laughs> Jonathan Harker's Journal. 30th of October, Galatz. At nine o'clock this morning, we boarded the Tsarina Catherine in the river harbour. There we saw the captain who told us of his voyage. He said that he ran with a favouring wind through fogs and all till he brought up blindfold at Galatz and put into port. Immediately a man came aboard with an order, written to him from England, to receive a box marked for one Count Dracula. Producing a receipt, the captain gave us the man's name, Petrov Skinsky, a man known to deal with Slovaks who trade down the river to the port. The captain handed over the box to him. That was all he knew. We were unable to find Skinsky. With heavy hearts, we came home to the hotel, to Mina. Mina Harker's Journal. 30th of October, evening. They were so tired and dispirited that there was nothing to be done till they had some rest. I made them all lie down for half an hour and asked Dr. Van Helsing to get me all the papers that I had not yet seen. Whilst they were resting, I went over all carefully. I believe I have made a discovery. Looking over the maps, I am more than ever sure that I am right. My new conclusion is ready, so I shall get our party together and read it. Every minute is precious. 
Mina Harker's memorandum entered in her journal. My surmise is this, that in London the Count decided to get back to his castle by water as the most safe and secret way. When he travelled to England, he was brought from the castle by Zigani, who delivered their cargo to Slovaks, who in turn took the box down river to Varna for shipping to London. Thus the Count had knowledge of the persons who could arrange this service. So from London, the Count wrote to Skinsky and arranged the carriage of the box up some river. I have examined the map and find that the river most suitable for the Slovaks to have ascended is the Sereth, which runs up around the Borgo Pass, as close to Dracula's castle as can be got by water. Mina Harker's journal continued. When I read my memorandum, Jonathan took me in his arms and kissed me. The others kept shaking me by both hands, and Dr. Van Helsing said, Our dear Madam Mina is once more our teacher. Now we are on the track once again. I shall get a steam launch, said Lord Godalming, and Jonathan and I will follow him, and Dr. Seawood and I with horses will follow on the bank, lest by chance he land, said Mr. Morris. Good, said the professor and I will take Madame Mina into the heart of the enemy's country, to Dracula's castle. There is work to be done there. Later. Our little expedition will start within an hour. Lord Godalming and Jonathan have a lovely steam launch, and are ready to start at a moment's notice. Dr. Seawood and Mr. Morris have horses, and are shortly to set off on their long ride. They will keep up the right bank, where they can see a good stretch of the river. Professor Van Helsing and I are leaving by train tonight for Veresti, where we are to get a carriage to drive ourselves to the Borgo Pass. We have all got arms, as there may be wolves. The weather is getting colder every hour. It shall take all my courage to say goodbye to my darling. We may never meet again. Courage, Mina. There must be no tears now, unless it may be that God will let them fall in gladness. Jonathan Harker's Journal October the 31st. I am writing this on the steam launch on the Seraph. Some of the Slovaks tell us that a big boat passed them, going at more than usual speed, as she had a double crew on board. I wonder where Mina is now, and Van Helsing. God guide and help them. Dr. Seward's Diary. 4th of November. Five days on the road, with only the rest needful for the horses, but we are both bearing it wonderfully. Today we heard of the launch having been detained by an accident when trying to force a way up the rapids. We must push on. Our help may be wanted soon. Mina Harker's Journal, 31st of October. Arrived at Veresti at noon. The professor has bought a carriage and horses, provisions and fur coats and wraps. We have more than seventy miles before us, and are to start in an hour. We are truly in the hands of God. 2nd of November, morning. We travelled all day and all night, taking turns driving, and have made good speed. Now the bright day is on us, and there is a strange heaviness in the air that oppresses us both. It is very cold, and only our furs keep us comfortable. At dawn the professor hypnotised me. I answered, Darkness creaking wood, and roaring water. So our enemy is still on the river, which is changing as they ascend. 2nd of November, night. All day driving. The country gets wilder as we go, and the great spurs of the Carpathians tower around us. By morning we shall reach the Borgo Pass. Tomorrow we reach the place where my poor darling suffered so. God grant that we may be guided aright. Memorandum by Abraham Van Helsing 4th of November It is morning, and the sky is full of snow. Madame Mina sleeps and sleeps. We got to the Borgo Pass just after sunrise yesterday and turned down this road. We go on for long hours, and as we travelled, I held down my head and slept. I waked and found Madame Mina sleeping too, and the sun low down. We were near the top of a steep rising hill, on the summit of which was such a castle as Jonathan told of in his diary. I took out the horses and fed them, and made a fire. Near it I made Madame Mina comfortable amid her rugs. Then I drew a ring round where Madame Mina sat, and over it I passed some of the sacred wafer and broke it fine, so that all was well guarded. 
She sat still all the time, and no word she said. Presently the horses began to scream and tore at their tethers. In the dark there was a light of some kind, and it seemed as though the snow flurries took shape as of women with training garments. I began to fear, horrible fears. The wheeling figures came closer, but keeping ever without the holy circle. Then they began to materialize till they were before me the same three women that Jonathan saw in the room who would have sucked his blood. They smiled at poor Madame Mina and said, Come, sister, come to us. In fear, I turned to Madame Mina. Oh, the terror in her sweet eyes. God be thanked she was not yet of them. I seized some of the wafer and advanced on them. They drew back, laughing their low, horrid laugh. I fed the fire and feared them not, for I knew that we were safe within our circle of protection. At the first coming of the dawn, the horrid figures melted into the burning mist and snow and were lost. Madame Mina lay in a deep and sudden sleep from which I could not wake her. I have made my fire and seen the horses. They are all dead. Now I go to my terrible work. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 4th of November, evening. The accident to the launch has been a terrible thing for us. Only for it we should have overtaken the boat long ago. We have got horses and follow on the track, and we have our arms. The Zigani must look out if they mean to fight. If only Morris and Seward were with us. Mina... God bless and keep you. Dr. Seward's Diary, 5th of November. With the dawn we saw the Zigani dashing away from the river with their lighter wagon. Snow is falling, and far off I hear the howling of wolves. There are dangers to us from all sides. We ride to the death of someone. God alone knows how it may end. Dr. Van Helsing's Memorandum, 5th of November, afternoon. When I left Madame Mina sleeping within the Holy Circle, I took my way to the castle and found the old chapel where I knew my work lay. I knew there were at least three inhabited graves to find, so I searched and searched, wrenching away tomb-tops, until I found the two dark sisters. I go on searching until presently I find in a great tomb that other fair sister lying in her vampire sleep, so full of voluptuous beauty that I shuddered. By this time I had searched all the tombs in the chapel. There was one great tomb, more lordly than all the rest. On it was but one word, Dracula. It was empty. I laid within it some of the wafer, and so banished him from it forever. Then I began my terrible task. It was butcher's work. God be thanked my nerves stood. Had I not seen the gladness that stole over the faces ere the final dissolution came, I could not have endured the horrid screeching as the stake drove home. But it is over. Before I left the castle, I so fixed its entrances that never more can the Count enter there undead. When I stepped into the circle where Madame Mina slept, she woke. She was thin and pale and weak, but her eyes were pure and glowed with fervor. And so, full of fear, we go to meet our friends and him. Mina Harker's Journal, 6th of November. It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I took our way towards the east whence I knew Jonathan was coming. When we had gone about a mile through the drifted snow, we looked back and saw the clear line of Dracula's castle cutting the sky in all its grandeur. As we looked, we could hear the distant howling of wolves. Taking out his field glasses, the professor began to search the horizon. Suddenly he called out, Look, Madame Mina! He handed me his glasses and pointed. In front of us, and not far off, I could see through the flurries of snow a group of mounted gypsies hurrying along. In the midst of them was a long lighter wagon, and on it a great square chest. My heart leapt as I saw it, for I knew that at sunset the thing which was till then imprisoned there could in any of many forms elude all pursuit. See, said the professor, they are galloping as hard as they can, racing for the sunset. We may be too late. God's will be done. Once more he trained his glasses on the plain. Look! 
he cried again. Horsemen coming up from the south, Quincy and John. I took the glass and looked. Then turning, I saw on the north side two other men riding at breakneck speed. One of them I knew was Jonathan, the other Lord Godalming. They too were pursuing the party with the cart. They are all converging, the professor shouted. When the time comes, we shall have the gypsies on all sides. I got out my revolver, for whilst we were speaking, the howling of wolves came louder and closer. Every instant seemed an age whilst we waited. We could distinguish clearly the individuals of each party now, the pursued and pursuers. The professor and I crouched down behind our rock, our weapons ready. All at once, two voices shouted, Halt! Instinctively, the gypsies reined in. Lord Godalming and Jonathan dashed up on one side, and Dr. Seawood and Mr. Morris on the other. Dismounting and raising their rifles, seeing that they were surrounded, the gypsies drew their knives and held themselves ready. I could see Jonathan on one side and Quincy on the other, forcing away. In an instant, Jonathan jumped upon the cart and, with a strength which seemed incredible, raised the great box and flung it to the ground. In the meantime, Mr. Morris was fighting his way through the Zigani. The knives flashed as he won his way through them, parrying with his great bowie knife. Jonathan had by now jumped from the cart. As Quincy Morris joined him, I could see that he was clutching his side and blood was spurting through his fingers. The gypsies, seeing themselves covered by the rifles, made no further resistance. With desperate energy, Jonathan attacked one end of the box lid with his great cookery knife, while Quincy attacked the other frantically with his bowie. Gradually, the lid began to yield. The nails drew with a quick screeching sound, and the top of the box was thrown back. The sun was almost down now, and the shadows of the whole group fell long upon the snow. I saw the Count lying within the box upon the earth, deathly pale, the red eyes glaring. As I looked, the eyes saw the sinking sun, and the look of hate in them turned to triumph. But on the instant, Jonathan's great knife flashed, shearing through the throat, whilst at the same time Mr. Morris's bowie knife plunged into the heart. Before our very eyes, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. In that moment of final dissolution, there was in the face a look of peace such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. The gypsies turned without a word and rode away, as if for their lives. The wolves followed in their wake, leaving us alone. Mr. Morris had sunk to the ground, holding his side. Oh, God! He cried suddenly, pointing to me. It was worth this to die. Look! Look! The sun's red gleams fell upon my face, bathing it in rosy light. With one impulse, the men sank on their knees as their eyes followed the pointing of his finger. God be thanked, cried Quincy Morris. All has not been in vain. See, the snow is not more stainless than her forehead. The curse has passed away. And to her bitter grief, with a smile and in silence, he died. A gallant gentleman. Note. Seven years have passed since we all went through the flames, and our happiness since then is, we think, well worth the pain we endured. Godalming and Seward are now both happily married. It is an added joy to Mina and to me that our boy's birthday is the same day as that on which Quincy Morris died. His mother believes, I know, that our brave friend's spirit has passed into him. We call him Quincy. We often meet and talk together of the old time, and of the papers which have remained in the safe ever since our return so long ago. How could anyone accept so wild a story? Van Helsing summed it all up as he said, with our boy on his knee, we ask none to believe us. This boy will someday know what a brave woman his mother is. Already he knows her sweetness and loving care.
Later on, he will understand how some men so loved her that they did their much for her sake. Jonathan Harker.